This is what too much alcohol does to the human liver. The level of scarring is such that the body just can't put that right again. Liver disease is the fastest growing illness in Britain. Are you its next victim? Tonight on Dispatches, the shocking results from our mobile clinic. Liver disease in Britain may be even worse than doctors fear because we're drinking too much. If we do not do anything about it, we are looking at an epidemic that the health service will be, will find impossible to deal with. We expose the tactics of the powerful drinks industry who fight any policies that might reduce their sales. The fact that the industry would react did not come as a surprise. What came as a surprise was, was the ferocity of this attack. We reveal the inside story of how Whitehall plans for wide-ranging health warnings on cans and bottles have been scrapped. If we say on the back of a packet of fags, smoking kills, maybe we should say it on the back of a, a bottle of alcohol as well. And our investigation shows what's been happening unseen in hospitals all over the country. Okay, flash, flash. Over 7 million people in Britain drink too much. Louise is one of them. She's 28 and suffering from severe liver disease. After a decade of heavy drinking, Louise is now an alcoholic. Doctors have warned her she could be dead in two years. Tell me I mean, when you started drinking, how old you were and you know what, what you thought about it when you first started drinking. Well, I just had like one, two glasses of wine, not much. And then that escalated. I used to have everything, really. Um, good job. Got my qualifications. I could do anything. It's just cold. Oh, it's ruining it. Stupid. <laughs> Hospital admissions for alcoholic liver disease have doubled in the last 10 years. And for the first time, large numbers of younger people are being affected. Well, the numbers are increasing and we're seeing more and more people. Our average age is coming down dramatically. It was once 60s, it's now an average age of about 40. We're seeing a lot of deaths. Our youngest death on the unit is 22. So these people are just drinking thinking they're having a good time, not doing any harm, and one day wake up with conditions just like Louise. Alcoholic liver disease doesn't just affect alcoholics. Anyone who's drinking heavily is at risk. The government is trying to find ways of getting that message across to millions of people who don't consider they've got a problem. So starting in London, Dispatches is finding out how aware people are of liver damage. That knowledge might prevent some drinkers developing a disease which could kill them. We're running a mobile clinic, providing free liver testing to the general public. First stop, Finsbury Square, in the heart of the city. So how would you describe your drinking habit? Well, I try not to spill any. <laughs> this blood test will show if the liver is already in trouble. <laughs> Uh, oh, we're getting drinker mainly, Friday, Saturday, Sundays usually. Then Dr Rajiv Jalan, a liver consultant, with a new machine called a Fibroscan. It detects changes in the liver tissue caused by alcohol. Three to four is normal, anything over five is worrying. So how much do you drink? We drink five or six Jack Daniels a night. Every day? No, 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 just no, like Friday good. and Saturday, really. Right. That's a um, score of 5.4, which is out of the normal range, OK? Wow. OK, so we accept a value up to 5 as being normal. Right. So it is really it's thinking quite about shocking, it. It's actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, look, it's, 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 that, that's the purpose of this uh, exercise. Yeah. 
We'd expected about 5% of people to have raised levels, but our first few tests suggested a much bigger problem. As you can see, the number that you see is 7.8, right. which is significantly higher than a normal liver. Okay? I think you need to see a GP. Okay. You'll obviously need some other blood tests okay. to find out it's not anything else that we can need to do something about. And it may then be lifestyle issues. Yeah? Right. This guy reading is 13.9. Uh, he said that was abnormal. And he said that uh, one should abstain. Uh, I asked him how long for, and he said months. Uh, and it should go back to normal, um, uh, hopefully. And I, I will be going to the GP, as and, suggested. And why do you think it is 13.9? I mean, what's your sort of drinking well, history? I, I actually, as I drink the same as all my friends, uh, I thought, um, which is kind of just Friday and Saturday night, get, get, you know, um, spending down the pub. We tested about 40 people. To the doctor's horror, over half had abnormal readings and several showed signs of serious liver damage. These are high-earning, high-drinking young professionals, so we were expecting some abnormal results, but I have to say that absolutely everybody has been astonished by the results that we've had. Oh, there's this 40-year-old girl who works in the city. She's doing fantastically well from the sounds and looks of it and she has astronomically high scores and you know I don't know whether whether to cry or to you know to take her into another room and counsel her where do you start because she is only one of several of her colleagues who may well be in that same position the prevalence of liver disease in the 20s and 30s in the young successful people is rife and if you do not do anything about it, we are looking at an epidemic that's going to face us in 15, 20 years with cirrhosis in these people that the health service will, be, will find impossible to deal with. The NHS already spends almost £2 billion a year dealing with the effects of alcohol. In the final stages of liver disease, the only option may be a liver transplant. We've come to Birmingham to watch an operation. The new liver has just arrived at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. It's exactly 12 hours since the team heard an organ was available more than 100 miles away. The donor died from head injuries. The patient, Muriel, didn't know she was seriously ill until a few months ago. Liver disease builds up silently. But without this transplant, she'd be dead in a year. A 68-year-old lady who used to drink quite a lot. More socially, I think, she sort of lived around the world. And uh, unfortunately, over the last few months, she has deteriorated both in terms of her liver function as well as having developed a cancer in her scarred okay. diseased liver. In the early stages of the disease, the liver can repair itself. Muriel stopped drinking five years ago, but that was already too late. And the liver itself is scarred and shrunken and small and diseased. So the fact that it's all knobbly, that's what's telling you that it's cirrhotic, is it? Yes, that's yes. Quite down to normal. The government says it wants to target people like Muriel, make them more aware of the risks so they cut back long before they reach this stage. So we're just stapling the vein. Start taking the liver out. The liver's out. Bill's old liver was taken from the operating theatre straight to the research laboratory, and we followed it. I don't know if you've seen liver in a butcher's shop, but it would normally be a very smooth, purplish colour. Whereas here, we can see that there's mottling. There's these areas where it's discoloured, and then these lumpy bits and where what really... What are these lumpy bits? Well, this is the kind of change that we see with cirrhosis. So the healthy liver cells, which are the sort of purplish colour, are replaced by bands of gristle which join up and eventually if you have enough of this fibrosis, this gristle tissue in the liver, it becomes cirrhotic and cirrhosis just really refers to a stage of scarring that's 
really irreversible. The scarring's got to a point at which it can never really recover. Government figures suggest up to one and a half million people may be developing livers like this without realising it. Back in theatre, the new liver is ready to be plumbed in. Already more and more people need this operation. Doctors fear the queues will grow and it won't just be patients like Muriel. But I know my colleagues out in the uh, referring hospitals are seeing uh, more and more younger patients, more and more patients with uh, more severe forms of alcoholic liver disease earlier on in their, in their lives. Nine days later, we heard Muriel was well enough to talk to us. Because liver disease is a quiet killer, it crept up on Muriel through years of heavy drinking. Thank you very much. We took along a laptop to show her the damage she'd done. Now, that's your liver there. Oh, was it? Oh, my God. Kill me. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, actually, with that inside you, that you weren't more ill than you were. Oh, exactly. You weren't, you weren't aware That's of right, it. That's right, yeah. But while I'm sitting here looking at that, I'm thinking to myself... How lucky. How lucky I am. Yeah. How difficult's it been for you? Terribly difficult. You can have me close to tears now. Close as I've been. But the two of you can look ahead now, can't you? In, in a way that you really couldn't before. Yeah. In part two, the government wants an inquiry into whether cheap booze is fueling the health crisis. We show how the drinks industry and the retailers are fighting that message. Sheffield on a Friday night. For years, Britain's alcohol policy has focused on law and order issues out on the streets. Doctors say health problems like liver disease haven't been given enough priority. Two weeks ago, the government said more needs to be done to encourage people to drink sensibly and make them aware of the risks if they don't. Do you know what liver damage does? I mean, do you know what liver cirrhosis is? Have you ever heard of it? No, 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 I don't know what it does. But you think about what everything might do to you. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't drink enough for it to bugger me up. <laughs> two pints and I'm knackered. I'm <laughs> sat down She's had more than two pints. The government says women shouldn't regularly drink more than two to three units of alcohol a day, three to four for men. But many people are confused by the size and strength of drinks. One unit is half a pint of standard strength beer, which is three and a half percent. But most modern lagers are quite a lot stronger than that. So a can of Stella Artois, 5.2 percent, which means that this one can has got 2.3 units of alcohol in it. So two cans a day, over safe limits for a man. Four cans regularly, you risk significant health damage, says the government. With wine, again, it very much depends on the strength of the wine, and they do vary a lot. This Australian red has almost 11 units in it for the bottle. So a standard pub glass, which is 125 mil, that's 1.8 units. But if you were to have a large glass, and it's certainly what most of our wine glasses are, then that is three and a half units of wine. One large glass a day, already beyond a woman's safe limit. Two glasses regularly risks significant health damage. Millions of people drink that and more every night and think it's safe. In a London hospital, we met someone who's discovered that it's not. Once the skin's all nicely numbed, grows into a punch of pain. Paul is having tests to see if he's suitable for a liver transplant. Without one, he'll die. The odds of survival are minimal. And, but if I have the operation then, and it's successful, 
then it's looking good for the future, so I'm very positive about it. With the pressures in the right side of the heart and the pulmonary circulation, that's the blood flow to the lungs, is too high, then we can't go ahead with transplantation. Okay, so we're just going to insert this catheter into the sheath. Everyone copes with alcohol differently. Doctors discovered Paul has a common genetic condition, which he knew nothing about, which made him more susceptible. Paul has clearly got what we call end-stage liver disease. Once you start to accumulate fluid in the, in the abdomen, in the belly, as, as, as Paul has, we know that 50%, half of those people, will be dead two years later. We can see that the catheters come all the way down and it's round and it's sitting in the pulmonary artery going off towards there. So I'll take a picture of that. OK, that's the test finished, sir. If Paul's heart fails the test, it means no transplant and he'll probably die. I'm pleased to tell you that the pressures on the right side of your heart are actually very good. I'm pleased for you. We're seeing more and more people like Paul who work in the city or work busy jobs, who drink socially with meetings, entertaining clients, come home in the evening, have half a bottle of wine or more to re just to relax after a busy day's work. They're not getting drunk, they don't, they're not dependent, they have high profile, high powered jobs and yet they get liver disease and it's happening more and more. Paul's home from hospital. He was a successful accountant. He's almost unrecognisable from three years ago when he celebrated his 50th birthday. It was, a, it was a stunning time, wasn't it? It was good. They both worked and always opened a bottle of wine when they got home and finished it between them. Very rarely did either of us get steaming drunk. It was just... You know, the, the, oh, we didn't? No, well, yeah, sometimes I did. Oh, well, but, maybe you did. But, you know, but you never, it, it was never that sort of really excessive stuff. And, yes, we were breaching the 14 through 21 units of alcohol, but so was every, everybody, everybody else. else does. You always know at the back of your mind that you're drinking too much, but you think, well, doctors are very conservative, so if they say it's 28 units, then you can probably push it to 32 or something. Uh, 32 or, or something. Double it double even, that. maybe. You know, um, you because it won't happen to me. And um, you just do. You just sleepwalk into this. Our liver testing roadshow has moved to Birmingham. We set up in front of the town hall to attract a mix of people. Shoppers, students, passers-by, anyone who likes a drink. I can easily get through three bottles of wine quite happily, so... In how it's long? In a in night? A night. Uh, probably about ten points a day. But I only ever drink real ale. If it's there, we'll drink it. It's as, it's as simple as that. Do you know how many units that's, you're supposed to yeah. drink in a week? That's a proper like, that's messed up. Yes. So, it's five past twelve. We're doing the first test of the day. We've only been open for business five minutes, but we are already booked out completely right through till six o'clock. And that's because in the hour that it's taken us to set up, so many people have come past and said they wanted the test that we've booked appointments right the way through the afternoon. So that's it. The rest of the day now, we're just going to have to turn people away. If I can get you to slip your card again. Dr Andy Holt from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is working the scanner which picks up any damage to liver tissue caused by alcohol. OK, well done. Well, it's higher than we would expect. Um, you're lovely and thin, you're young, and I would normally expect your reading to be somewhere between three and a half and four, OK? And you can see on here that it's seven. 7.1. What did you say about that? Oh, it's too high, so I've got to go and see my GP and stop drinking. So. Uh, all my friends, you know, I don't drink more than my friends, so... You don't? No. They're all drinking at the same levels as Absolutely, you? Absolutely, so I should show this to them. When people are young, their liver can take a huge amount of punishment and still recover. But many of those we saw were pushing their luck. 4.1, what did he say about that? He said I'm the wrong end of average, so as long as I keep an eye on how much I'm consuming, we should be all right. I drink a good six days out of seven. On a quiet night, about four pints. On a big night, well, it's wine. I've got a worryingly large tolerance to wine. I can easily get through three bottles of wine quite happily, so... In how long? In a in night? In a night, yeah, You're it's kidding. quite... Well, on my birthday, I drank a box of wine, it was four pints, oh. And I get a horrendous memory and I don't know, it's, I can see him perfectly fine and walk and talk, but really have no idea what's going on, so that's why I thought it probably best get checked out. What came across so clearly was how many people drink at home almost every night. 
they buy their wine from the supermarkets. It's cheap, so they can afford to drink more. The reading was showing the 4.9 on the scan, um, and the doctor explained that that was uh, a degree of stiffness you would have expected a little bit lower than that from the results that I have from here. So um, it's perhaps nothing to uh, be too, un too disturbed about, but um, I think I'll watch what I'm drinking. You're mainly drinking at home, are you? Yes, I would. I mean, we do, we do go out uh, with friends and then occasionally lunchtime, but um, if I'm going to drink it, it'll be in the evening and it'll be a couple of glasses in the evening and perhaps three on a Saturday. Do you think you are buying more and therefore drinking more because it's cheaper? Yes. Definitely? Yes. Consumption is up. It's certainly up in my household and I know it's up in the households of many of my, my, my friends. And is consumption up because of price? Is there a direct link for you? I think so. Three bottles of Blossom Hill wine for £10 is a very good bargain at the end of the day. You can't buy a bottle of wine in a restaurant for £10, a good bottle of wine. And whenever you do your shopping, I'd automatically put in a bottle of wine in the, in the trolley. And are you attracted so. by all the discounts there are? Do you think you're buying any more? Yeah, I Probably think... Probably dying different brands. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I think the discounts do have an attraction, don't they? Like three bottles for £10 or, or whatever, you know, so, yeah. Do you yeah. think it makes you buy more and drink more than you would yeah. otherwise? Because if, they're in, if it's in the house, then you're more likely to open it if you've over, over-purchased, yeah. This week's bargain... Yeah. <laughs> £4.95 for eight, so... What do you think of that as a price? I think that's a really good bargain, myself. We want to have some fun. As in London, just over 50% of people here had abnormal results, ten times what doctors expected. So the government may have badly underestimated the health crisis ahead. I think it's too freely available. I think it's available to those who shouldn't be drinking. And I think its cheapness these days means that it's actually available in quantities that previously people just couldn't afford to drink, uh, which is leading to some of the problems we're seeing. The supermarkets sell about half the wine we drink and 20% of the beer. The Competition Commission recently accused the big chains of selling some brands for less than they actually cost. The supermarkets don't admit that, but they certainly have some good deals. We decided to see how drunk you could get for £20. First, Asda. Right, I have bought six bottles of red wine on special offer any six for £20. Each bottle, it tells you on the back, has got 10.8 units of alcohol. So if you get through this lot in less than three weeks, you're exceeding your maximum recommended allowance. So £20 worth of alcohol from Sainsbury's is more than I can actually carry, because they've got a special offer. You get two of these boxes for 20 quid. That's 40 bottles. That works out at 50 pence a bottle of Stella Artois. Finally, Tesco's, and no question about which products they're promoting. Three bottles of Tesco Valley Vodka, £6.23 a bottle, and each bottle has got about 25 units of alcohol in. So 75 units for your 20 quid, and that represents, for a man, three weeks' worth of drinking at the maximum recommended level. Supermarket prices are making the pub trade furious. This is the annual trade show for pub owners and managers. We want one of these in the glass every single time. But it's the youngsters, really, isn't it? That's what it's aimed at. Perhaps the biggest change in our drinking habits is how much more we consume at home rather than in the pub. But landlords, like Nick Griffin, feel they still take all the flack of irresponsible drinking. Publicans feel that under threat because they're having to take all the responsibility. The supermarkets are believing that their responsibility ends after the sale. Nick runs a chain of more than a dozen pubs. He explained why he can't compete with rock-bottom supermarket prices, starting with beer. I think the product that everybody will know is a bottle of Budweiser. The Tesco's price per litre for Budweiser is £1.83. That's what you can go and buy it for. That's your VAT duty, anything done, all done. The cost for me, the cost price for me, is £3.34 per litre. So before you add on any of your normal markup for running costs, staff costs or whatever, yep. you're already paying two-thirds more than the supermarkets are selling it for. Yep. So that's beer. What about spirits, so vodka? 
That's 25 ml of vodka. That in Tesco's is 22 pence, and I would sell that for about one pound eighty. So that's about almost nine times what it is in Tesco. Yep. We have stopped happy hours. We have stopped two for three promotions. We have stopped anything that will encourage people much of entered into. Uh, because we, we know that we have to be responsible retailers of alcohol. So when you walk past the supermarkets and you see them advertising, you know, two for the price of one, three for the price of two, you know, half price, well, what do you feel? I, I feel I wish they had to abide by the same laws that we had to. <laughs> Down the road is the Wine Trades Annual Fair, and they're very happy with supermarket prices. We're drinking 50% more wine than a decade ago, although last year consumption didn't go up. A lot of the supermarkets got it on special offer. Six bottles for twenty pounds. Yeah, fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> it's rock bottom prices, though, isn't it? Uh. The government suspects these kind of discounts are making us drink more, but the trade absolutely deny that. There are special offers at the end of every aisle. It's piled up by the checkout. I mean, you know, bulk buy discounts. Isn't that all? encouraging people to drink more? No, I would disagree with that. I would say that it's a very competitive marketplace, the retail marketplace. People are competing um, to show their brands to the consumers. I think the retailers are offering good value to their customers and it's what the customers are looking for. Um, I don't believe that uh, sales equals consumption as some people seem to try and make out. They're not going straight out into the car park and drinking all of this. They are saving it and drinking it over a period of time. Um, and therefore sales does not equal consumption as far as I'm concerned. But senior doctors point out that alcohol costs half what it did in the 70s and we're drinking 50% more than we did then. I'm very unconvinced by the idea that uh, bulk offers actually don't cause people to buy and drink more. If people would buy and drink just the same amount when it was more expensive, why were the supermarkets discounted? People are driven by the price. They are prone to pick up a bottle of wine that they may not have done when they go in for their coffee and tea. It depends whether you consider alcohol to be an ordinary commodity. Putting up the price would probably deter young drinkers most of all, which is exactly what the government wants. Most people here in Sheffield started the night's drinking at home. It's called preloading. It's cheaper to buy alcohol, do you know, from a shop or something and drink yeah. at someone's house. And then, drink, house. And then have a little right bit into of a session. bar like that. We've been and in just one keep bar topping and up. come out, yeah, top we up. We keep topping yeah. up, because otherwise it costs too much to get. Different bars and it's like a cheaper, bar to cheaper to... So how much do you spend and what are you buying and what, what are you paying for? Right. Well, tonight we've bought a uh, crate of 24 for Carly. £10. And a bottle of vodka. How much do you pay for a bottle of vodka? Where do you get the cheapest Sainsbury's is a bargain all the way. Tesco. Big crepes, big crepes. Tesco, Tesco. 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 Sainsbury's and Tesco. The supermarkets told us their customers bought alcohol as part of their regular grocery shopping. They said they supported sensible drinking campaigns, which gave consumers information to make their own choices. This is Brussels. Getting drunk is a European-wide problem. So last year, the European Commission published a huge report which concluded that cheap alcohol was a key factor. And yet the British government has just announced it will repeat the exercise next year to look at prices, discounts and advertising, all of which were covered in the European report. That report also shows how hard the industry fights any attempts to restrict the amount they sell. At the centre of the storm, the British doctor who wrote the report for the European Commission. Peter Anderson is internationally known as an expert on public health. The fact that the industry would react did not come as a surprise. What came as a surprise was, was the ferocity of this attack. There's a mass of scientific evidence on the harm alcohol can do and how to reduce it. Peter Anderson evaluated it all and published his findings last summer. The effective policies are those that make alcohol less easily available. That is, the price of alcohol, you need to put the price up. 
the availability of alcohol don't make alcohol available all the time everywhere and the advertising and marketing of alcohol that you have to limit it if not ban it completely. All the policies the industry reject. They're aimed at reducing overall consumption rather than targeting just problem drinkers. This is the headquarters of the Brewers of Europe and it's within easy lobbying distance of the European Parliament building which is just a couple of hundred yards away at the end of the road. Some of the fiercest opposition to Peter Anderson and his report was coordinated from inside this building. They hired an American PR firm with offices in Brussels to write a rival report. They selected a group of academics who then concluded we shouldn't penalise all drinkers by making alcohol more expensive or less available, a finding the industry approves of. All those academics signed off on that end report. So they were involved from the start right the way through to the end. And they it was, signed it was a off very on the... short process based on research that was selected for them to read. And they signed off on that as being a valid contribution to the debate, as representing good evidence in this particular area. But evidence so it that wasn't... was selected for them. I mean, it wasn't like the Anderson report, which set out to review all the evidence over many months and hundreds of papers. Well, this was a snapshot of evidence selected by the industry experts selected by the industry that produced exactly what the industry wanted it to. I don't think you'll find the Anderson report did look at all the evidence. Peter Anderson says his report was comprehensive, so I put the findings of the rival report to him. It says that reducing overall consumption won't affect the overall problems of alcohol misuse. It says there's not enough evidence to say that alcohol is a major cause of problems in society and that there's no general health hazard associated with drinking, moderately, and indeed there are positive benefits. So, I mean, those are three very pithy conclusions. These are very pithy conclusions, but they are all counter to the enormous agreement and consensus of the science of alcohol and alcohol-related harm and alcohol policy. More lobbying was to come. The industry persuaded the European Commission to do something unprecedented, to let yet another group of experts review Peter Anderson's report. We've seen an email sent by the beer industry spokesman. He claimed those experts would totally discredit the report, but they didn't. A month later, alongside detailed comments, they summed up Peter Anderson's work as important and impressive. I've got an email that you sent out um, where you said um, that this peer review was going to say that there were fundamental flaws in the selection, analysis and presentation of data and the conclusions of the report are lacking in academic rigour or credibility. Now that's what you're saying this document says. It doesn't say that at all. Well, I think many of the academics who undertook that peer review did raise serious questions about the way the evidence had been looked at. But that's not what it says. It says well, it all the say viewers, without exception. Yes, it doesn't say it in that sentence, but if you look in detail at what the peer review report actually says, it does raise questions about the way in which that study had been approached. It raises small individual details, but at no stage does it say what you've claimed it says, that there are fundamental flaws and that the report's lacking in academic rigour or credibility. I mean, you've seriously misrepresented what the peer review has said, haven't you? I believe that what that peer review actually came up with were serious challenges to some of the conclusions that Dr Anderson was making on this particular issue. In Brussels, the lobbying has worked. The industry have batted away any danger of new laws. Instead, the focus will be on educating people, their favourite policy. We've ended up with a product that I think is a missed opportunity in the sense that it has not called for things like let's get better taxation policy in place, let's get much tougher on advertising. It's come, if you like, weaker on these points and it's come with, again, too much focus on educational approaches, which that's where we see the influence of the alcohol industry. In Britain, the industry contributes £30 billion a year to the economy, so politicians listen to their views. 
In part three, why the industry objected to explicit health warnings on cans and bottles. And we reveal how those plans have been scrapped. Doctors fear Britain is facing an epidemic of alcoholic liver disease. This is what it does to the body. Fluid builds up in the stomach. Every fortnight, Peter comes into the Royal Hallamshire in Sheffield to be drained. All right. Mm -hmm. Paul, you'll just feel a sharp scratch like normal oh, and a bit of stinging, all right. Up to 11 litres will be drained from his stomach over several hours. Peter's not an alcoholic or a home wine drinker. He worked in the searing heat of the steel mills, and 20 years ago, everyone drank beer throughout the shift to quench their thirst. Done well already. An hour into the drain, and Peter's relief is obvious. So, Peter, tell me, how are you feeling now? Fantastic. Yeah? You cannot buy this feeling. It's impossible. As soon as your first three litres go and you can start breathing. When the swelling is at its worst, like it was this morning, what, what's the effect on you? You can't walk, because you can't get your breath. You pant like an old dog. It's pressure on your lungs. You tend to get a bit daft with your blood pressure, because it's pressure on your heart as well. And you just feel in that because you can't bend down, you can't put your socks on, you can't put your trousers on. And you just feel like a piece of useless garbage, if you want. The alcohol industry believe education is the key to sensible drinking. Certainly Peter is an example of how ignorance can kill. Just as smoking wasn't recognised as dangerous 50 years ago, we still seem to be learning the hard way about alcohol. The day after a drain, Peter's well enough for a gentle walk. At one time, he used to run 14 miles every night along this same path. He feels that today's drinkers are just as much a victim of ignorance as he was. They still don't realise the risks they're taking. I'd say take them up to Livy, wouldn't it? And let them have a look at state of people that they're in. People as pure yellow. There's got no left. Let them have a look, see what it was, what they're doing to the self. But let them come and watch me struggle up and downstairs, whistling away to know. Let them see it. I can see it daily. Let them have a look. Not only me, anybody. Anybody with a liver problem. The industry say people can make their own decision about how much they drink. It's about giving them the right information. And yet they've just objected to plans to do exactly that. The Department of Health has been holding meetings for 18 months about what sort of health warnings might go on all bottles and cans. One of the groups consulted was the British Liver Trust. So you sent them, what, 11 quite, quite strong, pithy messages? Quite. Take me through some we, of we've, those. we've said, avoid alcohol if you're pregnant, avoid alcohol if you wish to conceive, for instance. But then also, alcohol abuse can destroy families, alcohol can spoil your complexion, alcoholic cirrhosis can kill the under 30s, alcohol kills. You know, if we say on the back of a packet of fags, smoking kills, maybe we should say it on the back of a, a bottle of alcohol as well. But the only people on the committee that took the final decision were the industry and civil servants. The government says that's because labelling is a voluntary agreement with the industry. It's got the Portman Group, the British Pubs Association, the Gin and Vodka Association, the Scotch Whiskey Association, Wine and Spirits Trade Association. So it's all the alcohol groups that represent the alcohol industry, plus government. So it's only the alcohol industry and government on that yeah, group? There's, there's, no, there's no other third party that would bring in the health and social harm. Alison showed us what the government finally announced three weeks ago. The Department of Health said consumer testing showed people responded to unit information but not health warnings. So a pregnancy message is the only one that will be included. And the industry haven't even agreed to that. What worries me is that 
for most of the population, they are now going to think, OK, that's not related to me. I'm not a woman, I'm not trying to conceive, I'm not having a baby. So the message is diluted, and I'm concerned as to why we've gone for the pregnancy message. What? Where was the decision made that the pregnancy message was the one that would go on and the others were left behind? We put in a freedom of information request for the committee minutes, but it was refused. The government can block the release of any discussion about how policy is decided. The wine trade had a representative on that committee. There was a sensible drinking working group, which your organisation was part of. Indeed, yes. And I know that there were lots of discussions about possible other labelling messages. Can I ask you why, you know, you booted them out? I mean, for instance, too much alcohol can raise your blood pressure. What's the problem well, with that? I don't think we booted them out at all. I think that this was agreed with government that you can't include all this information on the back label of a bottle. What I'm clear on is actually one of the things the consumer wants to know about is what's this wine like, what's this spirit product like, what should I drink, drink this wine with? Um, and, you know, that's, that's one of the bits of information the consumer wants. But they may also want to know what it could do to them health-wise. Tell me your objections to some of the others that were up for discussion. So, too much alcohol can raise your blood pressure. How much is too much alcohol? Okay. What does that mean? Long-term heavy use of alcohol can cause heart failure. Well, again, what does that mean? It's, it's too vague a statement to be able to be put on the back label of a bottle. Alcohol cirrhosis can kill the under 30s? Again, it's too vague a message to put on the back label of a bottle. What's and your weight alcohol is calorie heavy? Well, again, that could be an entirely incorrect statement in, in relation to some alcoholic products. But, but uh, you know, something like white wine is actually very low in calorie content. It's got lower calorie content than apple juice. But isn't the fact that you're going to object to anything that makes alcohol sound as if it can have health consequences? No, that is definitely not the case. Then why the not go for take, some of these messages? The industry takes its responsibility on this very, very seriously. We don't believe that the back label of a bottle is the best way to co communicate what are some very, very complex messages. The government's view is that the industry must take the lead in educating people to drink responsibly. But health campaigners say, clearly, that hasn't worked. I think, unfortunately, the drinks industry has a, uh, a shareholder base to satisfy. It has to look at the bottom line. And if the evidence-based ways of reducing harm mean that the country drinks less, it's not surprising that the drinks industry will not be behind that. One last day of free liver tests. Dr Rajiv Jalan is with us again. And we're right across the road from the House of Commons. We've invited about 200 MPs, mainly members of the all-party beer group, which supports the beer and brewing trade. The vice chairman of the group, Nick Harvey, is our first visitor. Please come have a sit down. Look, I think your liver is in good health. Well. Please hear it, it's been given enough provocation. <laughs> <laughs> then Julie Kirkbride, who, like Nick Harvey, admits that most evenings she drinks up to half a bottle of wine. Okay, Okay, that looks pretty good. We'll stop there, okay? <laughs> I can't tell you how relieved I am. I don't go binge drinking, let me just make it clear here. But I am a bit naughtier than all those guidelines suggest I ought to be. Yes. Then Peter Bottomley, MP. If the government is determined to tackle harmful drinking, then it must reach not only those who binge, but also the middle class, half a bottle of wine, stay at home drinkers, okay. like many MPs. Well, the thing is that your liver tests are actually very good. We waited for the next MP, but clearly supporters of the beer industry don't make liver health a top personal priority. So it's now coming up to 20 past five. We've been here, what's that, five and a quarter hours, and we've had three MPs, and that's out of 200 that we emailed. It was disappointing, especially because our testing in London and Birmingham exceeded Dr. Jalan's worst fears. Liver disease is set to become such a massive problem, politicians, as well as doctors, will have to deal with it. When we were discussing doing this, I had expected to find about three, four, five percent abnormalities in the patient, in the normal population that we were going to be studying. What we have seen is a minimum of 30 to 60 percent abnormalities 
in the normal population. And it just tells us the epidemic that awaits us in terms of liver disease if we don't do something about it right now. So what would you like to see done? Is there a way of taking our snapshot and making it into something more systematic and nationwide in some way? I, I think that is exactly something that we need. We need liver awareness, much in the same way that we have cardiovascular awareness, we have cholesterol awareness, we have obesity awareness, we have smoking awareness. Um, uncomfortable for you. you More people to... might be aware if they witnessed the true horror of alcoholic liver disease. Oh, okay. Blood vessels in the throat can swell and burst. Swallow down, my friend. Sufferers can vomit several pints of blood and die. To stop that happening here, they're clamping off the vessels. High-tech medicine for a totally preventable problem costing the NHS nearly £2 billion a year. And that's the price of alcohol we can't afford. A major documentary explores the devastating impact of economic change on the countryside. The Lie of the Land on More 4 at 10. And next here on Channel 4, Cutting Edge visits an extraordinary place of learning, the Dangerous School for Boys.